Follow us to stay updated on debates, discussions, facts and tips about health. Click on the subscribe button and the bell icon for latest updates. How many times have you found yourself standing there, uncertain and anxious, asking the same question? Is my child's fever something to worry about or is it just another passing ailment? Instead of worrying about fevers, it would be more productive to focus on enhancing our knowledge about the causes and treatment methods for high temperatures in children. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Somra Saluja from Zip Media to help us decipher the complexities of fevers in the children. We have with us renowned health expert, Dr. Meghna Farke Sultania. Dr. Meghna is an accomplished pediatrician and neonatologist with more than 11 years of experience. She specializes in child health and development and currently practices at the Metro Heart Institute and Multi-Speciality Hospital in Faridabad. Her areas of expertise include managing pediatric patients, immunization, pediatric infections, seizures in children, and nutrition issues for both pediatric and adolescent patients. Dr. Meghna, SIP Media welcomes you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion. Yes, uh, so, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, we all know that uh, fever in children is a common concern for parents. Uh, mm -hmm. So, let's just uh, begin by asking what exactly is considered a fever in a child? And at what time should parents be able to distinguish between a mild rise in body temperature and a more serious condition that would necessitate medical attention. And uh, are there different guidelines based on the child's age for the same? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we would always uh, come to like you know certain groups when it talk when we talk about fever in pediatrics. So newborn, infant, uh, child, adolescent. We talk it in that way. So see, when it comes to newborn and infant's body, their body has not yet learned and the brain is not mature enough to regulate their own temperatures, okay? So essentially, right. when a newborn is placed in a hotter environment, they start having fever. And as against a colder environment, they literally, the body temperature drops, all right? That's what right. we call as hypothermia. Same happens uh, more or less degrees with infancy as well. They need right. to be taken care of temperatures. So that's a very extremely sensitive area when we talk about newborn and infant uh, having fevers. In children and adolescents, of course, uh, the regulation is better. Yes, but uh, the fever can go on a very higher note. And that has to be properly controlled in time to avoid right. it complicating. So when it comes to about majoring fever, uh, see, we can measure temperature orally or uh, say the tympanic membrane, which we call central body temperature, also at bum area, the rectal body temperature, and uh, skin surface, like with a uh, standard thermometer, which we which is generally used in axilla. So right. when it comes to a normal body temperature, it is 97.7 to 98.6 degree Fahrenheit, which is a normal body temperature. It's a range. And it may slightly vary in uh, terms of seasons as well. So when we are recording a temperature which goes beyond 98.6, that is what we're talking about, fever. But when it comes to, uh, when we are checking temperatures in axilla or surface, we have to add roughly a 1 degree Celsius or 1 degree Fahrenheit to it to make it uh, comparable to the central body temperature. Right? right? So that means if you're taking it in an axilla, it will go to, uh, 99 uh, suppose will be read as 100 right but right. whereas in oral 99 will be 99 or in tympanic membrane or a ear thermometer 99 will be 99 so that's how we measure the temperature first of all and the range as I said uh, what it is if it goes beyond the range in case of newborn and infant we have to first see if they are overwrapped if they are overwrapped we can uh, remove the excess clothing uh, sponge the baby properly and recheck temperature in 30 minutes. Right. If the temperature still shows in a higher range, that means it's a fever and you need to give medicine. 
right? Extreme seasons like extreme heat or extreme cold, the checking and sensing temperature becomes a task and it has to be done with a due attention. Right. As well as I would like to uh, mention that when we are checking these temperatures, uh, we have to be careful and uh, about noting them down. Sometimes it happens that the fevers, they do not respond to antipyretics immediately. So sometimes we need to check temperatures every 30 minutes in case of okay. children. Okay. Right. And apart from this, uh, we can get other signs which are a little subjective. Uh, like they may have a central body parts which are hotter and uh, the peripheral body parts like your palms or the feet, they will be a little colder. If you put your palm over child's chest, then uh, you may feel that the heartbeat is faster or child is looking dull suddenly. These are the signs which uh, tells you that you have to see and check temperature, maybe there's pain. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So now after learning the accurate ways of measuring and knowing temperature, so uh, let us now learn that fevers in children can have various underlying causes. So what are some of those common causes of fever in children? And uh, kindly highlight the difference between a fever caused by a viral infection and the one caused by a bacterial infection. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a very important question. So when it comes to common causes of fever, all of us know infection is the most common cause of fever. Infection can be viral, bacterial, parasitic, or uh, something like malaria. Okay, so various causes are there. And apart from these infections, the other cause which make a lot of importance is severe dehydration, heat stroke. Sometimes fever can be caused because of certain uh, diseases which show fever for a longer range rather than three to four days. Examples like tuberculosis, right? Certain rheumatic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, etc. or rheumatological heart disease will also have fever and which will go for a long Certain uh, Mediterranean fevers are the fevers which happen in a recurrent way. So in general, right. fever is a very wide variety of genre and all sorts of diseases are possible even in infancy or childhood. So we right. have to be uh, very particular and we have to be attentive when it comes to the duration of fever and right. how, how often fever is recurring. Right? right. So in general, for under five years of age, and there is a high-grade fever, viral uh, diseases are very common. And right. viral fevers generally tend to recur often in a day, like four hourly, six hourly. They okay. tend to have a higher degree of temperatures, like 103, often 104. And uh, generally, apart, once the fever settles down, the child is happy, the smile comes back, the movement or the activity starts, and uh, lethargy is uh, generally um, off once the fever settles down. Right. And when against in bacterial fever, child is dull throughout. Right. Even if once the fever settles down, child right. is dull, not interested into surroundings, not happy with his uh, routine toys or right. uh, even after some uh, buddy's visit, etc. And bacterial fever can be even low grade or high grade. And there are signs of toxemia also, like there okay. could be eyes are red or heartbeat is throughout on a higher side and child is even not able to stand or trembles and eats less. All these things are possible in bacterial fevers. Right, ma'am. So you've just mentioned about the warning signs or the differences between the fevers caused by, caused by viral and bacterial infections. And you've also talked about the persistence of fever for a very, very long time. So are there any complications which are associated with these long-term fevers or the recurrent fevers in children other than the ones that you've just talked about? Yes, there are complications of fevers. As generally we talked about, she lethargy or uh, no, not very active. So at the same time, this whole fever, uh, when starts on a higher range, it dehydrates right. the child's body. So dehydration right. is very common. Uh, it can lead to even uh, decrease in the urine output of the child, which needs to be monitored. Child right. may have shaky hands or tremors, what we call, because there is low glucose. The tendency to of input is little less. So that can happen. Blood pressure sometimes falls down 
or even okay. childhood or even a newborn has blood pressure. So when there is toxemia of bacterial disease or, or certain viral diseases with the rashes, they are right. looking notorious. So those can also cause this fallen BP where the child can have giddiness, dizziness, so suddenly they become unresponsive. These things are possible. Extremely right. high temperatures like 105, etc. They may cause bluishness around your uh, mouth. Sometimes child also do breath holding during some very high fevers. They okay. may have shivers or jitteriness, right? And some uh, odd ways are there when the children can actually throw a seizure also in extremely right. high fevers. And uh, once pa parents, they uh, bring in their child to the doctor, how would a doctor address to these symptoms or these high fevers on an immediate basis? What would exactly. be the medical modality? Yes, the medical modality is generally uh, we see ch children for and their condition and we assess what is if they are looking very toxic. So we okay. need to know there is an emergency, first of all. That is what we call as a triage. So if there are right. any red signs, red flags, means child coming in seizures, or child right. whose parts are weak, or child who's okay. not passed during for more than three hours last, or child right. whose otherwise body function is fine, but intake is very poor and the blood sugars have gone down. These are emergencies in pediatrics. So this right. is what we assess. And if the fever is very high, generally an injectable mode is preferred. And right. even giving fluids is preferred. And uh, I have a very important concern here that many parents, they do not want to give medicines to children. I mean, always. And can or should fever in children be managed using home remedies? And if not, what could be the possible disadvantages of, you know, managing fevers at home? See, first of all, uh, certain things uh, which can be done at home to control fever is uh, sponging, right? That's very, very important. It's highly effective. Okay. And giving, but at the same time, if we do sponging along with giving a simple dose of paracetamol, it right. always helps. Because right. fever breaks body from inside, right? And right. if the child feels much better after paracetamol, why not give it? It's a very simple, small, basic medicine, right? right. And uh, fever maxima can go very high in a child. And they're not able to, the bodies are not um, old enough or adult enough to control it. So we right. have to assist to them. Secondly, if we are, if the fever takes a lot of time, dehydration sets in the role, which is always there. So right. if we can, uh, giving paracetamol at the right time prevents the complications as well. So that right. is what uh, we are supposed to understand. When it comes to home remedies, uh, fever is an acute condition. So right. if you have something which can work faster than a paracetamol, mm -hmm. then it is your choice. But see, as I say, uh, there are other paramedical sciences also, where right. there are certain medicines which can work. For example, ashwagandha or maybe certain uh, herbs or something, they may work. So if there is no paracetamol available and right. you are in some uh, area where there are no resources, but then you have to be doubly sure about this herbs. There has to be right. a proper prescription about the same. If you do not have an idea, then suddenly giving something which you have you yourself have no knowledge about, then that cannot be a trial and error. And I right. think paracetamol is very handy. It is available even in uh, rectal suppositories. If the children right. are not able to take it orally, we can mm -hmm. insert a rectal suppository of paracetamol to bring fever down. So it's right. that easy. There are patches also at times available mm -hmm. things are right. dead and one must take the whole full advantage of it so what i read from your uh from your answer is that uh, paracetamol could be handy and at the same time we can just uh, you know uh we can keep the child hydrated and adequate rest maybe uh could and be very very beneficial and sponging sponging is essential in high fevers it right. brings down your temperature at least by a degree and it helps right. aid the child so that's what is important. And at the same time, I suppose that monitoring of the body temperature and keeping in touch with your doctor would be absolutely yeah. beneficial and absolutely yeah. necessary for the patients yeah. and the parents. Why I, yes, it is necessary. And why I insist more about sponging is 
giving medicine also has its limits. For example, we cannot uh, repeat paracetamol within four hours. Right. And there are other medicines apart from paracetamol, which is to be used only in case of hydrate fever and after your doctors prescribe it. But there also there's limitation of dose, limitation of duration. Sometimes it happens with children that you've given paracetamol, there is no effect. You keep on sponging after four hours, fever is again there. That means fever is there continuously, 24-7. We call it something like a continuous or a remittent fever. And right. there the medicine only brings it down to a certain level. Okay. Just to feel good for a while. So that's why sponging is very important. It really aids apart from medicine. That was very informative, Dr. Meghna. Uh, we appreciate your presence with us today. We hope that the enlightening information shared will be very valuable to many families. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. And for more such informative videos, please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for regular updates. Thank you once again, Dr. B. Thank you. Thank you.